this is covering the spread. Here are your hosts, Jim Sawness and Dr. Ed Feng. What is going on, everybody? Welcome on into Covering the Spread. That's right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and NumberFire.com, where today we are talking win totals for the 2021 NFL season. We're joined by Edward E. Gross, of course, a professor at SMU and Pepperdine, also the host of the Odds and Ed podcast and a uh, one of the analysts on TVG's More Ways to Win. We're going to get his thoughts on his favorite win totals this year, his win total process, what training camp news we should care about, and much more. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a senior writer and analyst for numberfire.com. Joined here as always by Dr. Ed Feng. You can find his work over at thepowering.com. And Ed, you are coming to us live from, I believe, South Point, South Point Sportsbook in Las Vegas, correct? Uh, yep. I'm at the South Point Casino. And actually, the sportsbook's right behind me. The VSIN studio is right over there. Yeah. And uh, yeah, you know, it's um, the governor has a mask mandate for everyone inside so that's why i'm uh, i'm still masked up right now and yeah it's been it's been a great time so far but yeah, i can still hear you clearly this is great um the great. background looks lively i'm getting excited to be i mean i just like i don't know i want to go to a sports book right now this is yeah. fun in a fun atmosphere but also like you mentioned you were going to vegas you didn't mention you'd be like live on set with gil so like i'm on oh, twitter yeah. today and yep. i see gil tweet out something and i saw you quote tweet it, and i was like oh that's cool you know Ed's quote tweeting Gil. I know that they were going to meet up at some point. I'm like, oh, Ed's in studio. In That's studio. awesome. That's really cool. Yeah, it was fun. You know, it's kind of a lot different when you're on that side of things, right? Yeah. It kind of looks a certain way when you see the show, when you see the clips on Twitter. And, uh, but yeah, it's a little bit different being in the studio. And I'm actually staying here at the South Point. So I woke, I got some coffee this morning and VEASAN's like a cable network there, right? So you just yeah. flip on the TV, you turn on some VEASAN. <laughs> You hear Gil Alexander talking with Aaron Schatz about NFL win totals. So very pleasant morning. I mean, that sounds great. And then you go down and you just join him because why not? That is that is the life of Ed this week. Uh, what else is on your docket for this week in Vegas? Uh, got a bunch of meetings set up. Uh, Going to talk with Chris Andrews, I think, tomorrow. And uh, yeah, to see uh, what kind of trouble I can make. I got what? some uh, some data visualizations. I don't know if you can see that, but this is uh, some of the stuff I talked about on the show last week. And uh, so going to be passing some of those around. So if you are in Vegas, yeah, definitely hit me up on Twitter and uh, love the chat. Uh, so if you're passing out this stuff for your work, can you do this as a tax write off? Like, can you write off part of this trip? I mean, the power rank paid for the trip, so there's nothing really to write off. Wonderful. This is great. OK, I love yeah. it. OK, so Ed is uh, making the most of his time. And you mentioned some meetings. You're going to have a meeting with Edward Egros. He's going to be joining you in Vegas later on this week, too. Yep. That's going to be fun to have uh, two of our favorites uh, all in the same place. Yep, absolutely. He'll be joining me in a little bit. And uh, yeah, it'll be a good time. And we're going to preview that by talking to Edward in just a bit. Find Edward on Twitter at Ed with Sports. Of course, he is the host of the Odds and Eds podcast right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. He is uh, the one of the analysts on TVG's More Ways to Win, which I believe their first episode is Thursday of this week tomorrow. So you can find that on TVG. My TVG hat is somewhere over there. Uh, yeah, my TV. TVG account is lower than it should be. So I'll have to restock after watching uh, Ed over there later on. We're going to talk win totals, his process for that, and much more. If you want some more NFL podcasts, we have done plenty recently here in the month of August. We had JJ Zacharyson on talking player props. We had Aaron Dolan on talk about divisional outrights and all that. And also we got some college football talk on last week with Drew Martin talking about the futures market there, talked about a championship bet he likes, and also some win totals on the college side of things. To get all those, search for Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcast. We are now for podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, wherever you want to find us, you can get us there and make sure you leave a rating and review as well. We're going to talk to Edward Egros in just one second. But first, hey, sports fans, FanDuel is offering an exclusive promotion for new sportsbook users. Join FanDuel Sportsbook today and make your first bet. If you lose, we'll give you a refund up to $1,000 in site credit within 72 hours. Your first bet after depositing will qualify. 
if you have multiple selections on one bet slip, it will be the first selection you made. Head over to the FanDuel Sportsbook today and place your first bet. Must be 21 plus and present in Colorado, Iowa, Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Tennessee, Virginia, or West Virginia. New users only. Max refund, $1,000 site credit. See full terms at sportsbook.fanduel.com. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. In Colorado, 1-800-522-4700. In Iowa, 1-800-BETS-OFF. In Indiana, 1-800-9-WITH-IT. For confidential help in Michigan, 1-800-270-7117. For uh, help in... Uh, Tennessee, call the red line 1 800 879 or in West Virginia, visit 1 800 gambler.net. Covering the present. Let's bring Edward Egross back into covering the spread once again, this time talking NFL because with Edward, we have to clarify what it is because he covers 93 different things or so for yeah. odds and ads and everyone else. So, <laughs> Edward, welcome back. How are you doing today? I'm doing well, doing well. Uh, I'm upset that my backdrop isn't nearly as nice looking as Ed's, but that's all right. We'll roll with it. Yeah, Ed's is uh, dynamic, which is fun. Mine is very boring. You know, yours at least is the deep blue, which I think is, is yes. nice. And it uh, it brings out the eyes. You know, we're going to go mm-hmm. deep with the analytics here uh, on that as well. Now, you were talking before the show about how classes for you start next week. Is that for both? Mm-hmm. Are you teaching at both SMU and Pepperdine this year, or are you just doing one this semester? Yes. So next week, SMU begins, and then okay. in two weeks, uh, Pepperdine kicks off. And Pepperdine will now be back in person, so okay. I unfortunately have to brave the Pacific Coast Highway and the uh, ocean scenery to get to mm. class, which is going to be difficult, but I'm willing to make that sacrifice. So you're going to become a California traffic guy now. Are you prepared for that mentally to be the case? I I don't know if I am like it's one of those things like you don't know how much of a challenge it's going to be until you actually jump right on in. Yeah, I I am learning the highways and byways and like eight different ways to get to the same place. And I I don't have like my favorite traffic reporters in town yet. But if anybody is watching and or listening, uh, feel free to nominate someone because, hey, adding new friends in L.A. isn't a bad idea. Okay, this is good. Um, I I am into this for sure. Excited to see how this plays out. You're preparing, doing prep, and we, as always, appreciate that for sure. We're talking about some prep here, too, because we're talking about win totals across the NFL. And for a lot of people, at least for me, it was a pretty involved process to build up my win total projections and stuff like that. And there's a lot of factors that go into it. And the tough thing, I think, Edward, is deciding... Do we want to account for stuff that occurs during preseason? Do we want to ignore it? And I think that for me, I've been hesitant to change things based on outside of injuries, based on what we read during the preseason. But what about for you reading training camp tidbits? What do you need to read in order to actually alter your priors for things heading into the year based on what happens at training camp outside of injuries? So I have perhaps a different perspective than many do as far as that's concerned. So in terms of my background, I covered the Cowboys for six seasons. And before that, I sort of covered the Tennessee Titans from a distance. And so I'd say in terms of the camp preseason process, I probably have about maybe a decade under my belt of doing it regularly. And whenever I was a reporter, there were a couple of things I did. One, I would go to practice. And like you just said, I'm I'm checking for injuries. I'm checking to see if anybody gets hurt. And I'm also checking to see if anybody's laboring. So just because someone may not necessarily be on the injury report doesn't mean that they are 100%. Someone may be 85%. And it's just enough for you to pay attention. And that's something that you can mark down and pay attention to. And you can get reports on those kinds of things. And that's fine. But outside of that, typically the big thing that I had to do was find some wacky, quirky storyline to make the day go by, such as (laughs) asking Chris Johnson what he had for breakfast that day. And that was basically what my responsibility was as a local television reporter. And that's probably not that useful as far as putting together your win totals. So to me, not that camp is useless from a better's perspective and not that preseason games are useless either. I think there's a a lot of information you can glean from, but keep in mind that things are simplified for games and you're, you're playing a lot of backups against other backups. And so there are a lot of matchups that you're not necessarily going to see in the regular season. The other thing I would add too, is that if you're watching camp carefully, You can get a lot of good information as far as, you know, how crisp tackles are or how a backup quarterback handles dime packages. Those kinds of things can be useful. The problem is 
then you have to compare that to how 31 other camps are going. And no one reporter can really do that. And so for you to do real legitimate homework, you probably have to be at all 32 camps. And that's just not practical for any of us. So again, not that this information is useless, but to be able to really put together something dynamic, it's hard to do it without real consistent data. And that's not going to be as readily available this time of year compared with actual games. Yeah, absolutely. So Edward, in the preseason, we're thinking about betting win totals. It's a tough thing because your money's locked up for months. How do you, is that a market that you like, or do you like maybe trying to do some of the division win odds where you can get a little better return? Well, it's one of those things where it's not just about a potential payout. It's also about a potential loss as well. So if you're chasing plus money everywhere, then you are likelier to go broke a good bit sooner than most everyone else. Uh, what's interesting to me is that when we're talking about win totals, you can have like other analytically driven people uh, in your friendship circles disagreeing with you about, you know, any one particular team. I was talking with a buddy of mine uh, earlier this week, as a matter of fact, and we were talking about Kentucky and it's seven and a half win total. And we're looking at the schedule and there are a lot of easy wins and there are a lot of obvious losses like against LSU and Florida and Georgia. And then we came down to the last game against Louisville. And I'm a lot more bullish with Louisville than, say, my buddy was. And so he was coming up with a win total of nine, and I was coming up with eight. We're both over, but one is a lot more convincing as far as an over bet is concerned, whereas mine, I'm thinking, eh, seven and a half is about right because, you know, you may have something fluky happen against Tennessee. It is college football. I'm not comfortable with this. And so when I'm looking at win totals, yeah, you are you know tying down your money uh, significantly, but at the same time, if I find a win total that is like one and a half or two above or below what the number is, I'm looking for those inefficient markets. And they're, even in the NFL, you're going to find a team, which I assume we'll be talking about soon, but you're going to find a team that has an inefficient number. And those are the things that I'm looking for. And besides, uh, on the FanDuel Sportsbook, you can find alternate win totals. Right. And if you, if you are really, convincing, uh, really convinced about something being two or three above or below what the number should be, then go after that. So, you know, for instance, uh, you know, I'm looking at, you know, Jacksonville, for instance, at six and a half. That's one that I find really intriguing because I really like this team. Uh, obvious upgrade at quarterback. The receiving core is really, really solid. Uh, defense may have some uh, positive regression to the mean. And so if you go to eight and a half and take that over, you get plus 270 or seven and a half is plus 170. And you won't get any argument from me as far as either of them are concerned, especially given Jacksonville's easier schedule in the AFC South. So that's a, that's a route you do have. But for you, do you find yourself going to those alternate markets or do you like to stick with the the more the less juiced markets and stuff like that to give yourself the better odds of actually winning your bet? I probably go less juice as far as win totals are concerned. Now, you know, as we talked about alternate spreads and alternate totals over the years, that's something where I'm willing to, you know, sort of place my own bets and make my own numbers there. Uh, but as far as win totals are concerned, it, it, Every so often I might find something juicy and I do like to at least pay attention to those things in case I find something really nice. But for the most part, I, I think your basic win totals are usually about right. And if I can find something comfortable, then I go ahead and pounce. Okay. So let's talk about some win totals here. And I think the best way to do this is break teams into tiers because okay. obviously you're a math guy. You understand mm -hmm. betting towards the mean. And mm -hmm. that means I feel like we do need to break things up. We'll look at the top teams first, then look at the, uh, the mid tier teams and the bottom teams, because again, they're all very different discussions here. Let's start with the top teams. There are seven teams right now with a win total of 10 and a half or higher, actually eight now because the Packers are uh, up to 10 and a half. They were 10 previously, but now 10 and a half. We've got the Chiefs, Bucks, Bills, Ravens, 49ers, Rams, Browns, and Packers in this top tier. And if you want to go over 10 and a half, that's an 11 and six record for this year. So, you know, you need to have a pretty good team. Anything stand out to you there in terms of overs or is it just unders for you in this tier? Well, 11 and six, it's not just, you know, having a good team, but, you know, injury injuries have to go in your favor as far as not having them. Uh, things have to click in terms of coach, uh, you know, coaching and play calling, play design, things like that. A lot of things have to happen for you to get to 11 wins. And so it's something where for the most part, I tend to steer clear of that. But one team that I do love uh, as far as an over is concerned, and I know it's a bit of a cheap way out, but 
I'm taking the Buccaneers to go over here. And it's one of those things where I think we forget that Tampa Bay uh, didn't have a phenomenal regular season. It was good enough, obviously, to, to make the playoffs, but I wouldn't necessarily call it a banner year there. It's just that once they got to the playoffs, things started to come together. And defensively, which you know the focus where I want to you know, place my attention on, uh, drop back EPA and non-garbage time for the Buccaneers was 13th out of 32 teams. And yeah, EPA per rush defensively was first, and I know that's not stable, but pass defense has a lot more to do with your overall success. And I think when we watched that Super Bowl and what the Bucs did to Pat Mahomes and the fact that they weren't blitzing and still causing a lot of pressure, wreaking a lot of havoc, uh, preventing you know long throws down the field, to me that says that this pass defense has room for real growth and that they're going to experience positive regression to the mean. So to me, the Bucs have a couple of things going their way. One – uh, in terms of offensive stability, that should still be there with Tom Brady. Defensively, I think the pass uh, the pass defense should be a, a good bit better this go round than last. And let's also not forget that they're not having to face Drew Brees anymore. So really, there are three things I'm pointing to say. You know what? I think the Buccaneers could be even better this go round. I don't necessarily think I like them making the Super Bowl any better, uh, but the over win total is is fine with me there. Now, as far as an under, as far as his top tier is concerned, I'm going with Cleveland here. I have some real reservations about the Browns. Last season's expected record was a shade below eight and eight, yet they went 11 and five, telling me that they won a lot of close games, uh, which typically isn't consistent from one year to the next. Um, you know, that should be a cause for concern. Uh, you're exaggerating a win over a bad offensive team in Pittsburgh during the playoffs. And then you face Kansas City when Pat Mahomes didn't finish the game. Baker Mayfield also had the second longest time to throw of any starting quarterback in the NFL. And usually that leads to some problems uh, if that persists instead of getting the ball out much more quickly. So there are enough reasons for me to believe that things can sort of fall back down to more of a 500 kind of record for the Browns. And again, the division they're in is really, really tough. And I don't think we should discount that either uh, with the Ravens. The, the Bengals could be really good. And I, I'm not a you know big fan of the Steelers, but there are enough reasons to look at that schedule and feel like that the Browns could fall back down to reality. I think that if you want the Browns to get to 10 and a half, over 10 and a half, you have to expect that pass defense to make a massive, massive leap forward. I'm expecting them to be better because yeah. they got a lot of good pieces to, to add to that team. They had a lot of injuries last year in the secondary, and I think they've got depth there now, which they did not have. But even when I improved their pass defense projection a pretty decent amount from where it was last year. I saw them at nine and a half wins. Mm -hmm. That's a full win below this number. I have not bet the under because I am not allowed like in this mm -hmm. household to bet against my son, Baker Mayfield, but like <laughs> I, I haven't gotten there yet, but like my numbers do agree with you that that 10 and a half is pretty lofty. So I think, I think based on, meeting expectations for this past defense, it's really tough for me to get 10 and a half personally. Yeah. yeah. Uh, unlike you, Jim, I have bet that under. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> did it here at the South Point Sportsbook uh, not too long ago. So definitely agree with what Edward's saying. I don't have the same love for Baker Mayfield that you do. I did want to ask Edward, though, uh, you know, Tom Brady is not a spring chicken. So any reservations there about betting the Tampa, that Tampa Bay over? I, I really don't. And and it's it's one of those things where we've talked about Tom Brady being over the hill for the last like 10 years now. At True. some point, it will fall off. And when you look at older quarterbacks, it usually happens pretty quickly uh, whenever that fall off, that precipitous fall uh, occurs. But until it does, I, I still feel comfortable. And it's one of those things, too, where I go back to, you know, not this offseason, but the one prior and I got to believe that Tom Brady, who should know himself better than anybody and knows sort of what his biological clock is telling him, uh, he wants to go to the best situation that can sort of extend his career as long as possible. And that receiving core is still really, really good to where, OK, maybe he has to play, you know, to, to the tune of uh, shorter throws, getting the ball out much more quickly. Well, he has receivers who can do that. Uh, Drew Brees was able to extend his career uh, by a few years basically by relying on Michael Thomas a good bit. There's no reason why the Buccaneers with that personnel can't do something similar if Tom Brady does have that drop-off this year. 
Excellent. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, and I think that we'll – I mean, I've, I've stopped giving up on Tom Brady. So I think that uh, I'll just uh, ride along with you there as well. Let's talk about the middle teams now. Uh, we got teams with – a win total between seven and a half and 10. And here, unlike with the Browns, we're not betting towards the mean because they're basically at the mean to begin with. So we're actually looking for teams we may be higher on or lower on than market. Do you see any value in this tier, Edward? Well, one note I'll make before uh, offering my two teams is that I think if you're looking at, say, Pythagorean expected records, and, and I know I alluded to it earlier as far as the Browns are concerned, to me, this middle tier is probably where you will have your best opportunity to exploit uh, that sort of plexiglass principle where one season it, it went really well, the next season it won't go uh, so swimmingly. Because I feel like that with the expected records, the tails get a little bit misleading. So if someone was extremely good or extremely bad, that that formula may not hold as much water because the tails are a good bit thinner. Whereas this is really the, the area where I want to look at those expected records and feel much more comfortable about what I'm getting. So it's one of the reasons why the Tennessee Titans, for instance, I'm taking an under on them. Uh, it's, it's something where it's very possible that they can still win the division, but I do have some real reservations about Ryan Tannehill in large part because I think what sort of gave him new life in Nashville was play action. And as we know, play action makes you a better quarterback, makes you a better offense in general. And I know he's getting Julio Jones now, but I also know that the pieces that they lost were also significant. And there were some play action, quick throws, slants, things like that, that really made that offense click. And I'm not sure if that's still going to be there this time around. So there are enough significant changes for me to have some reservations about the Titans. And it, you know, it's also something where, okay, they do a lot of play action. It doesn't necessarily mean that they are an analytically driven franchise. I wonder if we look at like one or two things that are analytical and go, all right, yeah, that's sure. exactly. So now everything works and they've got a, this robust data science department. Well, not necessarily. Uh, you know, how they handle fourth downs has been abysmal, uh, for instance. And so there are a lot, and I think even the, the personnel that they've hired within the franchise uh, you know, I think they just got their first data scientist like a week ago or something like that. I, I, I'd have to double check that. You know, I know Seth Walder keeps up with those things better than I do. But uh, still, there are a lot of concerns as far as the Titans. I'll take the under there. Uh, one over, I love the Atlanta Falcons. Yes, they're in the same division with the Buccaneers. But uh, Matt Ryan, I think, can still play well. Uh, the NFC draws the AFC East, the, a division with a lot of uncertainty. I, I do like the Jets. I don't know if I'm in love with them just yet. The Patriots have some quarterback questions with Cam Newton and when to bring in Mac Jones. Uh, the Bills, you know, what are we going to get out of Josh Allen? Basically, I look at the Falcons' schedule and go, there are some easy wins and there are a lot of uncertain possibilities to where all you need to do is get to eight and you've hit your over, and I'm comfortable with that bet. Excellent. So, Edward, let's go to the bottom uh, part of the NFL, teams that we're not expecting to do that well. We're talking Giants, Raiders, Bengals, uh, Jags, Eagles, Jets, Lions, uh, Texans. So this is uh, a group that you would bet over if you expect some kind of regression to the mean. Uh, any thoughts about these teams? So, Ed, this may be an opportunity for us to disagree and have a battle royale before, uh, you know, before uh, hanging out in Vegas. <laughs> but... I feel pretty good about the Giants, and I know that Daniel Jones uh, is very turnover prone and fumbles and gets sacked and has uh, all sorts of issues in terms of uh, possessions ending the way he doesn't want them to. Uh, so, yeah, those are concerns. But first off, it's a low number. And I think when we evaluate the NFC East from a year ago, we like to just say, oh, you know, they, they were all terrible. You know, and there was no good team there and, you know, they're going to be bad again. Well, keep in mind that they were going up against the AFC North when the Steelers won that division. The Ravens were good. The Browns were good. That was a really tough schedule for everybody. So I look at that and feel like those win totals may be deflated a little bit, and there may be an opportunity there. The other thing, too, is that if the Giants do have a healthy Saquon Barkley, I don't necessarily care about the running game, but he will be used a good bit out of the backfield. And 
having that additional receiver with Jason Garrett as the offensive coordinator, uh, who does love to throw to the running back for some reason, certainly did it a lot with Zeke and the Cowboys. I feel like that's just another dynamic opportunity uh, for the Giants to score just enough to get over that that hump. Now, as far as an under sticking in that division, uh, I don't know what we're going to get about, uh, get out of the Philadelphia Eagles uh, this year. I feel like defensively they may be due for a little bit of regression, even though they have a phenomenal front seven. I don't know what to expect out of Jalen Hurts. The receiving core was really banged up. They have to basically redo that offense from the last few years. It was basically centered around the tight end because of short throws, yards after completion, all those things, uh, especially play action to the tight ends. Now they can't really do that anymore because they need the tight ends to block for a mobile quarterback. I don't know how quickly they'll be able to sort of transition seamlessly. And, you know, is, is Jalen Hurts really the guy they want there? That's also a big question. Uh, he was 31st out of 38 uh, qualifying quarterbacks in EPA CPOE composite, good quarterback metric for, uh, you know, overall abilities. I have enough doubts there to where I believe they're plus 1,500 to have the worst regular season record. I love that value there. I get the Texans, you know, won't be formidable, and there are a few other teams like the Lions uh, that may do a little bit worse. But at plus 1,500 for the Eagles have the worst record, I, I might pounce on that one. I think the reason that that is enticing and betting against Philadelphia in general is in part because of what they've done this offseason, but also the way their schedule sets up. They have told us with the way – they have been planning that they are mostly looking towards 2022 and beyond acquiring future first round picks and stuff mm -hmm. like that. But also their schedule is brutal. The first six weeks Four, four, their four lowest win probabilities in my numbers, the entire season all occur in the first six weeks. They have Tampa Bay, Kansas city, Dallas and San Francisco all within those first six weeks does not count Carolina or Atlanta. Cause who cares there? But like, let's say they get to week six. They could be 0-6. At that point, you tank. And so 15-1, to 1, to have the worst record in a situation where they could be in Week 6 without a win, I think that that's really enticing. I know that uh, Pro Football Focus, Dr. Heger, I believe, has mentioned that one as well as being enticing. And mm -hmm. I think that with the way, you know, my numbers don't like the Eagles either, with the way that combines with the way their schedule sets up and the way they've acted this offseason, I think that's a convergence of a lot of things that can lead you towards that one answer. 76ers basically built their franchise that way, and they're just down the road. So why not do the same thing, Eagles? The process is not dead, just yes. born again in a different franchise. <laughs> it so, has Edward, we don't want to limit you here to uh, just win totals. Any other bets, uh, futures bets you're liking for this NFL season? Yeah, how about Jacksonville to make the playoffs? I, I mentioned them as an over. I, how about we go a little bit deeper here and say uh, they'll they'll make it to January? I think that, you know, I mentioned before that the AFC South is going to be brutal. No faith in the Colts, no faith in the Texans. So right away, the Jaguars uh, could get 4-0 and there within the division. Then what's going to happen against the Titans? So basically, it's a 50-50 chance as far as, uh, you know, who's going to win the division. Maybe the Titans deserve a slight edge there. But like I mentioned before, Big upgrade as far as quarterback is concerned. I, I think as far as like the analytical folks, yeah, the Jaguars are not doing themselves too many favors as far as long-term decision-making in terms of, you know, getting a running back in the first round and those kinds of things. I completely agree that in the long term, uh, the Jaguars are not a team that I would necessarily, you know, want to keep boasting. But in the short term, offensively they have a lot of weapons and it's just a matter of if trevor lawrence uh you know has a short learning curve or a you know small learning curve uh and can implement this sort of urban meyer style and you now he's still a good offensive play designer and that's it's not like he lost those skills by not being in coaching for the last couple of years so you know the big thing for me is okay do, are these offensive playmakers going to come together at, at plus 300 give or take that, that's a pretty solid number given that the AFC very much can be top heavy and you're expecting them to win the division out of two potential teams. And even if they don't, are there going to be enough teams around to sort of supplement those wild card spots? I'm not sure at this point. So to me, Jackson will make the playoffs. I think is a good number. All right. Whatever. I like it. Whatever. They don't, they don't have the ultimate weapon in tight end T Tim Tebow anymore. Is there any <laughs> concern there? Uh, there is. Uh, there is. I'm concerned about uh, leadership. 
Uh, I'm concerned about morale and momentum. And uh, help me out. What are some other fluff? Culture. Words? Culture. Yes. Yeah. Without culture and and magnanimous personalities. Big muscles. Uh, yeah. Uh, the ability to to you know think and and feel and 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 win one for the Gipper. Like that's gone now. Yeah. Because uh, uh, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Deeply philosophical. I love it. Now, you mentioned yes. you're going to be in Vegas with Ed this week. So any big plans for you two uh, for this weekend out in Vegas? Uh, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, <laughs> Jim. I, 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 you know, it's one of those things like we, we certainly have come up with like a couple of places to go eat and uh, maybe a couple of books to check out or, or some casinos to check out. But other than that, I feel like Vegas, it, it's best not to plan too much unless you absolutely have to. I've never been. I mean, where go. Twitter goes to Vegas. They go to sports books and mm -hmm. they probably eat. So, yeah, what else like could you need? Plan. What? What else well, could you what? need? That sounds great. Yeah, grab a couple lemonades. Enjoy the. <laughs> yeah. Well, Edward, enjoy the lemonade. Enjoy mm -hmm. the sports books. Enjoy the food. Enjoy Vegas. Enjoy time with Ed, and hopefully, we will talk to you once again here on covering the spread in the very near future. Are you assuming that I won't survive this trip? I give it like a, I'll put the odds you survive it at minus one ninety. How about that? that that's it. What? That's implied yeah, of what sixty three percent. About that, yeah. So uh, yes. you know, you know, the odds are on your side, but there's some there's them, some so room we're, for we're shenanigans okay. in there for sure. There are, but I I was thinking at least two hundreds here. Like, okay, minus yeah, two thirty. Yeah, the odds have moved. On, you got heavy money on the on on your side here, so you're good. Fair fair all righty that is edward egross follow him on twitter at ed with sports and check out the odds and eds podcast and on tvg's more ways to win which is back once again this week edward we appreciate it we'll talk to you again soon absolutely covering the future big thank you once again to edward egross for swinging by and breaking down his thoughts on the 2021 nfl season specifically talking win totals and ed I don't know if it was on air or not last week, but you were talking about how you thought you needed to talk about the Browns and the Titans as being teams that could be contenders <laughs> for an under. And what do you know? Edward Egross comes on and talks about both those teams. Yeah. Uh, so it seems like you're on the same page there. Yeah, and Aaron Schatz talked about the, those same teams with, uh, with Gil this morning <laughs> and on my podcast. So, you know, I think it's good that, that we all necessarily agree. I already mentioned that I bet Browns under. Uh, I was going to bet Titans under here, but the price wasn't that good. So I'll, I'll do it somewhere else. Um, the, the preview series that on my, on the football analytics show starts next Monday. And so that first episode, you'll figure out exactly why, uh, I like Titans under, although I actually don't like that as much as Brown's under, I think that that's probably my favorite, favorite call. So I think when you look at the analytics and, and your numbers seem to agree with it as well. So I think when, when there's kind of agreement, uh, I feel pretty good about that. I feel like it was the same as like the Bears a couple years ago after they had that playoff season, really good run, and regression was the word of the day, and that was pretty easy. And then um, – so, yeah, it's it's nice when we all agree. We get a little wisdom of crowds effect, and uh, it's good to hear, even even if he does steal my thunder a little bit. Right, <laughs> exactly. So, the you know, the, the stolen thunder is a buzzkill, but, hey, if your bet looks better, that helps too. I will say that there is uh, – there are a couple people who are on the Browns in terms of, like, upside bets. I know Mike Clay of ESPN, a guy who I respect a lot, uh, is big in the Browns from a Super Bowl perspective this year. So, not full consensus among smart people who I respect uh, against the Browns, but yeah. – um, my numbers say under, your numbers say under. I, there, It does seem like most of the buzz does skew that direction. I just feel like for them to make a Super Bowl, a lot of things need to go right on both sides of the ball. Like yeah. I feel like Baker needs to make another leap. You know, my numbers didn't particularly like what that unit did last year. And then, you know, like they brought in Troy Hill and, and John Johnson from the Rams. And those guys were incredible in the secondary last year. So can they be incredible again? Well, maybe. And then maybe they're not the 27th worth pass defense, right? But I just feel like there's a lot of things that have to go right, and I just don't see them all going right. So let's see here. I have the – or last year the Browns' pass defense uh, ranked – so 29th by number fires metrics. I had them projected to rank 19th this year. So that's a big difference, and I still have an under. I, I still it have is. the nine and a half wins. So but like, to be – I mean, but even if that's the case, like you need to be a top five pass offense to be a Super Bowl contender based on that, right? Right. 
And that's as much as I love Baker, top five passing offense is tough. Yeah, that's asking a lot. So let's talk about right. another top five yeah. passing offense, Ed, because you're covering the future is about the Detroit Lions, <laughs> obviously destined to be a top five yeah. passing offense. What are you seeing with them in terms of the futures market? Yeah, so so it was interesting. I was either thinking about talking about Cleveland, Tennessee, or, or Detroit. Um, I'm glad I picked Detroit, so we have something a little <laughs> bit different to talk about. I think this team is going to be a complete dumpster fire this year. I don't know how else to put it. Um, and it's actually not because of head coach Dan Campbell and the famous press conference about biting kneecaps and yada, yada, yada. You know, he might be fine. Um <laughs> But think about it this way. I mean, I know they're kind of taking a long-term approach, but they downgraded at the quarterback position. Uh, they're, they're, they have Jared Goff now instead of, of Matthew Stafford. Anthony Lynn is the new offensive coordinator. He's been an offensive coordinator one year of his career. So it's not like they're bringing in like a long-time offensive mastermind uh, by any stretch. And they gutted themselves at the wide receiver position. So, so that's not good. You look at the defensive side of the ball, this was by far the worst team in terms of pass defense last year. The number three pick, Jeffrey Okuda, had a PFF cover grade of 30 out of 100. That's that's not good. That's that's well below the mean. And, you know, they're, they're relying on Quentin Dunbar to bring in. They brought him in the, at the quarterback position. I don't see good things uh, on either side, right? And the Lions and, you know, GM Brad Holmes is kind of taking this approach where – they, they focus a lot of their salary on the offense and defensive line with some of their signings. And I just feel like that goes away from where the modern NFL is going, where it's a quarterback passing league and, and you need to be able to cover. And I think the Detroit Lions do those two things at like bottom five NFL levels. So, so what does this mean? I mean, their win totals at five, I, I can't really bet under five. It just the, the history of the NFL suggests against that just with regression to the mean and, Everything should regress to eight and a half wins. You know, you get lucky here and there. I'm thinking about some alternative win totals possibly to bet, but like, I really feel like this team is going to be bad and bad and maybe in an epically historic way. I mean, I think that's a fair inclination and my numbers agree. I have Detroit at 5.4 wins. So similar to what you were saying, five is a low number. It's hard to take an under there, but the only team below them is Houston right now, based on my right. numbers. So it's Detroit 31, Houston 32. Are you thinking like a Detroit worst record type thing? Like, is it is it far enough where you would consider that for them or no? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I need, I need to get to my research on Houston before yeah. I do that. Yeah, stuff like that. You know, I mean, they're a seven-point dog at home to San Francisco. Week one, you know, my numbers kind of have it exactly at seven. Um, but definitely a team I'm looking to bet against for sure. Uh, I don't yeah. know if that's going to be week one. I don't know if that's going to be week two. Um, but I think the, the word of the year for Detroit is dumpster fire. I think this is going to be bad. Yeah, I'm at 7.011 uh, for that first game. So again, lockstep here, which makes me feel better about uh, where my things are at right now. Uh, and the Lions also fit the narrative that I was talking about with the Eagles, where their actions this offseason have said gearing for the future. The Jared Goff thing is is separate from that because it seemed like they got him right. to get an additional first round pick. So yeah. he does go counter to that narrative because he's not like the worst quarterback on the planet. But it seems like they took on his contract with the intention of just getting an extra first round pick, which makes sense. So yeah. I do think that 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 does back up what you're saying. They're focused in the future, just like the Eagles. And we should account for that when projecting how we think think teams will perform this upcoming year. I want to go well, to the yeah. opposite end of the spectrum. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, and Jared Goff is not the worst quarterback on the planet, maybe because he's had Sean McVay for the last couple of years. So Are you saying Anthony Lynn is not Sean McVay? <laughs> I am saying Anthony Lynn is not Sean McVay because Bold. they are two separate people. They are not the same person. <laughs> but, I'll work you know, on confirming that. We try to be accurate here. I'll work on confirmation that they're not the same, uh, but we'll, we'll save that for next week in covering the past. Right, that good. I want to talk positives here because why not? We've talked about a lot of under, so I'm talking about the other side of the spectrum because I've not made a Super Bowl bet yet on this podcast for this year. I've talked player props, win totals, divisional odds, make miss the playoffs, et cetera, et cetera. But my first Super Bowl future, potentially the only one because I'm not a huge uh, Super Bowl futures better 
will be the Packers to win it at plus 1,200. The reason is that I think that they're a top-tier team in the sport, and they're viewed as being a full tier below the Chiefs and the Bucks. The Chiefs are plus 500, Bucks are plus 650, and then it's a full tier down to the Bills and Packers at 12 to 1. I don't think the gap should be quite that big. And to me, those four teams, the teams that were in the, the championship game last year, are in the top tier in the league. The reason I think the Packers upside may be underrated this year is their defense. They were 12th in overall defensive efficiency last year based on number fires metrics. They were 13th against the pass, so middling. But that was with Mike Pettin as their defensive coordinator, and they hired Joe Barry, who doesn't have a good track record as a defensive coordinator, but he didn't have good individual talent that he had on those rosters that he has on this roster. They've got great players at key positions. Jair Alexander, Adrian Amos, Zedaria Smith at important positions where you want to stop the pass. Those guys all help you do exactly that. If you put players of that caliber at these positions on this roster, I think your defense has upside. Right now, I have Green Bay third in my power rankings behind Kansas City and Tampa Bay, and that's under the assumption that their defense is very, very similar to what it was last year. But I think they've got upside to outperform that and be better. And if they reach that upside defensively, they will close that gap between the Chiefs and the Bucks in a hurry. So to bet a Super Bowl future, I need a team that has a path to a ceiling. I think that having Aaron Rodgers and having a defense that has talented players at key positions means the Packers have a ceiling. So Betting them at 12 to 1 to me is super attractive. And I think it's worthwhile to make my first bet on the Super Bowl be on the Packers at 12 to 1. Now, I know in the past, like 2019, when the Packers had that 13 win season, you were not buying it. I wasn't either right. at that time. What about 2021? How are you feeling about this version of this Packers team? Well, the reason you, I wasn't buying it in the past was because Aaron Rodgers had come off a stretch of four not elite seasons. And exactly the opposite is true. He was phenomenal last year. He was the Aaron Rodgers that we all knew could happen. And, you know, motivation might be an issue. I don't know. But, I mean, once he gets back out there, you know, as all the drama of the offseason and draft day announcements of things, I don't know. I kind of think that all goes out the door when you hit the field week one. All of a sudden it's just competition and you want to win. And I think that instinct just kind of takes over. So, I think he'll be capable of being very good, and I agree with you. I think they have a lot of key pieces on the defensive side of the ball. My metrics agree with number fires almost exactly from last year, but you know, Jair Alexander was the top-rated cornerback in the entire NFL by PFF. Um, that's a little bit volatile, but but he's clearly a, a, super, uh, a very talented player that you can build that secondary around. So, yeah, no, I agree with all the things that you're saying. All right, so the Packers uh, to win the Super Bowl, the Lions to not our focus for covering the future for this week. That is all that we have here on covering the spread for this week, but we are gearing up for NFL season. So make sure you are subscribed to covering the spread wherever you get your podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher. It does not matter. Find us there. Hit subscribe. And if you like what you hear, leave us a rating and review as well. Big thank you to Edward Egros. Find him on Twitter at Edward Sports. Check him out on TVG's more ways to win and also check him out on the odds and ed's podcast as well ed uh what is going on with you this week over at the power rank while you're out in vegas yeah so the football analytics show i talked with phil Steele, publisher of the college football preview magazine it's a great conversation uh to, to say the least the man knows a lot about college football uh so it was great to pick his brain great to get some of his projections i was a little bit surprised about who he picked to win the entire uh, the, the college football national championship. So, so go check that out, the football analytics show. And then I'm really excited. We're doing the preview series the next two weeks. These are 10-minute episodes for every weekday the next two weeks. And some of the episodes are me. Some of them are, are Edward Egros. Uh, I'm very, very excited about the, the one he did on Heisman betting. And, um, yeah, so please check that out, football analytics show. And then I'm writing my uh, email newsletter at thepowerrank.com. Uh, there will be a correspondence going out on Thursday this week uh, about the Cleveland Browns. You probably know where I stand on them, but <laughs> um, but there's going to be a lot more. Uh, there's going to be a lot more football content uh, heading into the season. So check that out at thepowerrank.com. Yeah, we had Edward on to talk uh, Heisman betting two years ago and uh, really the in-depth research on 
what you want to look for in a Heisman bet. So uh, looking forward to that. The football analytics show to get the previews and the Phil Steele episode and the PowerRank.com to get the email newsletter. I am on Twitter at Jim Sonnes, J-I-M-S-A-N-N-E-S. You can also follow the FanDuel Podcast Network at FanDuel Podcast. Big thank you to Calvin Theobald, our video producer, for chopping up some video clips for the FanDuel social account from this podcast. Thank you, Cal, as always. And thank you to everyone for tuning in. Good luck to you this week with whatever you're betting on. We'll talk to you once again next week for likely some more NFL discussion. This has been covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. Aaron Dolan here. Thanks for watching and make sure you click below on that subscribe button for more great FanDuel content and check out some of our latest uploads and playlists right over here.